Hi, welcome everyone to Venable's monthly webinar of issues relating to advertising and marketing. Um, I'm Linda Zirkelbach, a partner, uh, copyright partner here at Venable. Uh, today we're going to be talking about key copyright guidelines to help your marketing and sales departments stay out of trouble. Um, the plan is to try and get through all the material in the slides and try to answer questions afterward. Um, there is a lot of material, so if we run out of time for questions, I can respond to them via email afterward. Um, I understand that this presentation provides an hour of CLE credit. About midway, I will verbally say a code for you. Um, and then I understand Venable is going to email the CLE submission form to all participants early next week. Uh, just to give you, before we start, just to give a little bit of background to give you some perspective on me and what I'm hoping to accomplish for all of you today. Um, I started my career at Venable, and then I was recruited to go work in-house in the music industry, where I handled front page copyright litigation um, that began with the Napster case and went on from there. Um, I was then general counsel of a publishing company before I came back to Venable. Um, so I understand some of the operational challenges within companies when it comes to a lot of the issues we're going to discuss today. Um, I think you'll find I lean towards the practical. Uh, and my goal is to really give you both an overview of the issues and some concrete practical advice uh, to be able to implement within your companies. Um, at the end of the slides, there's a bunch of slides that have pitfalls and practical tips. Um, that you're more than more than welcome to share within your companies to try to get some of your colleagues thinking about these issues um, on a daily basis. So <clears throat> with that, uh, we have a really broad range of attendees. So I'm going to start with the fundamentals because um, I have found that copyright law, by and large, uh, does not seem to be intuitive to many clients, but it can also be really high stakes uh, if you make mistakes in copyright law. So. Let's get started. Um, here are the key takeaways that I hope you're going to leave with today. Um, why the copyright statute is no joke. It's strict liability, which we'll talk about some more and what that means to everybody. Um, some of the key ownership and licensing issues that we see clients struggling with every day. Um, proper acquisition, documentation, and then management of the rights once you acquire them. Um, why your materials should undergo a copyright clearance review and related best practices to that. Um, we're going to cover text, photos, particularly, you know, fast-moving social media kinds of posts, which are really a big struggle for clients these days. Music licensing, um, issues related to video footage, uh, the significant limitations of fair use defense. And online infringement issues, um, there's user-generated content and the pretty often misunderstood DMCA safe harbor that you may know something about already. Um, and like I said before, common mistakes that we see, practical advice and tips. Um, and then if we still have time, even though this is really uh, supposed to be how to keep your marketing sales department out of trouble, I'm going to try if we still have time to cover just super high level the other side, which is how to protect the content that you own, um, although that is an entirely, you know, other webinar topic that perhaps one day we will have the opportunity to cover together. So <clears throat> starting out, what is a copyright? Um, really basically, copyright protects the original works of authorship or expression. Um, a patent protects the idea. And a lot of clients really have a hard time distinguishing between the different types of IP. Um, but a copyright is the actual work of authorship or the expression, the way you are putting that idea onto paper, the way you're making that movie, the way you're, um, you know, writing the particular article. Um, from the moment that the original work of authorship, which is not a very high standard, there has to be some modicum of creativity, is, quote, fixed in a tangible form, you actually have a copyright, uh, which a lot of um, people don't immediately understand. So you have a copyright from the moment your original work of authorship is fixed in a tangible form, meaning written down, recorded on some sort of, you know, voice recorder, uh, videotaped, photograph is made, et cetera, et cetera. However, the key is uh, that even in the old days, registering your copyrights was highly recommended for two major reasons. 
One was that uh, if you've registered your copyright either before the infringement starts or in what is a 90-day grace period that starts immediately when your um, work is published, uh, you are eligible to seek statutory damages in court which are much preferred to your only other alternative if you haven't done that, which are actual damages. Second reason is um, you also are available to seek attorney's fees if you would prevail in the litigation. Um, the now even more um, important reason, because the Supreme Court just resolved a circuit split recently, is you actually cannot even get into federal court anymore without a copyright registration. In the old days, some of the courts were application-based. You could get into court if you'd filed an application, and some of them required a registration. Now the Supreme Court has resolved that everywhere. You can't get into court without a registration. Um, just so you know, you can apply for them. You can expedite them for a lot of money, but it still takes a while. And when we have clients who call and are you know, really upset about some infringement, the last thing they want to know is that we can't actually file a lawsuit immediately and they have to then file an application expedite it wait for it to get you know approved so <clears throat> again um, registration is really important uh, and the beauty of copyright is there's no maintenance requirements some of you who do trademark will know that there are maintenance requirements in trademark in copyright it's pretty simple you file your application you hopefully do in fact get a registration and then you have it without having to continually maintain it like you do in trademark. So the costs are really not that great. Um, and sorry, I just accidentally um, advanced too far. So um, one really important point is copyright liability, copyright law is a strict liability tort. That's in contrast to many other areas of law. Um, and what that means is that a company can be held liable for essentially making a copy with, or a reproduction or a distribution or a performance or a display, et cetera. So the making of a copy, regardless of, number one, your intent or even your knowledge that it's infringing, et cetera, and two, even if your company does not actively create the infringing content. That's pretty big, um, which is what copyright is really a, a pretty serious area of the law where you can run into trouble really quickly. Um, the range of statutory damages that I mentioned earlier uh, on the slide before can be as low as $750 per work infringed and up to $30,000 per work infringed for what's uh, what a judge would call non-willful conduct. However, uh, the statutory damages can go up to $150,000 per work infringed if you're found to have willfully infringed. Um, and again, that's per work. So if there happens to be multiple works at issue, you multiply that and the numbers can get pretty big. Plus, again, um, you the infringer could have to pay the other side's attorney's fees uh, if the other side is the prevailing party in certain instances, which always is going to require that the party had a registration or at least the application was fired off within that first 90-day grace period prior to the infringement. <clears throat> so again, really briefly, um, there's a number of theories of liability in copyright law. There's direct, which most people probably would already be aware of, meaning as a technical matter, you copied, you know, you put the book on the photocopier, you distributed it, you sent it out to someone, uh, it's on your website. As a technical matter, a copy is made on your server and therefore it is a direct infringement on your website. Um, there's also theories of contributory liability, um, which means if your company has knowledge of the infringement and a material contribution to that infringement, that's a different um, way to be held liable. Another is vicarious, which is, um, you know, a, a sword really sophisticated copyright companies can use. Um, and the elements there are uh, your company gets a financial benefit from the infringement and you have the right and the ability to control the infringement, even if you did not directly do it. Um, and then a pretty new theory as of 2005 
Um, this is actually a case I was involved in in the music industry, the Grokster case. The Supreme Court articulated a new theory called liability based on inducement. Um, willfulness, I had mentioned in the slide before how you have the damages can go up dramatically if you're found to be a willful infringer. Um, those, that's proven um, by things such as the defendant had actual or constructive knowledge of the infringing activity or also frightening to some, um, the defendant's actions were either in reckless disregard or willful blindness of the copyright owner's rights. So you can see that there's a number of ways to get into trouble here. Um, fair use. <clears throat> you know, we, we have lots of clients who hope things are fair use, uh, and I want to really underscore fair use is a pretty limited exception. It's a pretty limited defense, uh, and I really don't love clients putting too many eggs in the fair use basket. Um, there's four elements. There's four uh, different elements that a court looks at. They are not evenly weighted. Uh, and I have seen sort of the same fact pattern come out different ways uh, with different judges. Some would say the same fact pattern is fair use. Some would say it wasn't. Um, and again, the four, you know, I'll just quickly go through them. The purpose and character of the use. Um, commercial versus nonprofit educational purposes is is in there, but it doesn't mean that everything for an educational purpose is fair use either. And particularly if you're making a commercial use of it for your company, you know this this doesn't cut in your favor. Um, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantial the amount and substantiality of the portion that was used in relation to the copyright as a whole. There's something called the heart of the work. So okay. You only took a little bit, but that's like the big part. That's the famous part. That's the part that everyone knows. That's what this element means. Um, and then the fourth, which courts are really putting a lot of emphasis in now, is the effect upon the potential market for the value of the work. Meaning, basically, if you did not get a license and you are claiming a fair use defense, uh, was the licensor, did they have a market for that? Do they charge others for that? Should you have paid for that? And were they harmed because you didn't pay them for the copyright, you know, copyrighted work that you used. Um, and that's a really, really uh, important one in the analysis. So why do we care about rights? Oh, sorry, I keep advancing too far. Why do we care about proper rights? There's a number of reasons. Um, the big four that I wanna talk about briefly are, you know, there's obviously, which I'm sure everyone is thinking of, the litigation risk, um, or even just demand letters. You know, we help clients with demand letters all day long um, where they've infringed something and the copyright owner finds out, and then we have to help navigate that. Um, another one these days in particular, um, certainly with social media, is just reputational harm. Uh, if uh, you are accused of infringing someone else's copyright, that kind of stuff gets out there, and it, it may not go over well um, reputation-wise. Another one is corporate M&A deal. You know, if you, if your company has any aspirations to be sold, um, et cetera, et cetera, get more funding, you know, your copyrights are assets. They will be diligent. And, you know, we do that all the time. And we do that for clients who are purchasing others. And you really want to have your copyright house in order. Um, and then another one is your insurance policy. Um, a big practical tip I have uh, is that you should check with your insurance broker. Um, the general insurance policy, you know, a just sort of general commercial liability kind of policy, in many cases does not include IP claims. Uh, there's a separate media insurance policy that one can get in addition to their general commercial policy um, that would cover IP claims. So I really, one big takeaway I want to impress upon everyone is to check with your broker. Um, if you ever do get sued for copyright infringement, does the policy you have right now cover it or not? Um, and I'm going to get to that later on in some slides, but in my experience, a lot of insurance companies, they want to know that you're clearing. You are doing a proper copyright clearance um, before they're going to insure you or before they're going to cover any claim. So um, I hope that helps someone out there on the call. Uh, proper acquisition of rights. Uh, here's some sort of buckets of uh, high-level things that we recommend. Um, you know, 
as we're talking about some of the things here and as you know you start to get a roadmap of materials you know training your internal teams not only the legal team but the business people and the sort of content creation and marketing people is really key um, you guys can you know have your internal trainings obviously we're more than happy to help with training like that as well if that's of use um, building a clear internal protocol when it comes to properly acquiring rights. So everyone is really clear on what is necessary, why it's necessary, and how all of that is supposed to work. Um, make sure you're entering into very clear, I, clear agreements with regard to IP ownership, licenses, pay attention to the scope. I'm going to break that down a little bit more in some slides. Um, don't use others' content without written authorization. There are certain instances where you can have an implied license or that sort of thing, but if you need it, you really are going to want to have that in writing to, to produce. Um, clearance checklists, which is another um, practice tip we'll talk about a little bit more. When I was in-house, I developed a clearance checklist for our business people because it was often really hard for them to even have a concept of how to approach clearing rights when they were building something, and, and legal can't necessarily sit you know, with the content or marketing people at all times. So creating clearance checklists for them to at least start thinking about the kinds of things they're supposed to have and do they have them before they then um, involve legal on any particular project. Uh, again, clearing your copyrighted publications. We're going to talk about that more in detail. Um, really be careful with social media because infringement can happen in the blink of an eye. Everything moves so fast and it's just, People don't often stop to consult and think about legal issues in the social media context. And then once you've done all these things, once you've done it all so well, have a copyright management database to make sure you are able to track all of these rights that you have so properly acquired. And I'm going to break that down as well. <clears throat> so um, ownership issues. We see this all the time. I just want to make sure that we're covering this at a high level for anyone who's not aware. Um, it is really rare that we see a company's IP rights properly documented when, we, when we're asked to look at something. And my favorite thing to say is, I don't judge, don't worry, like you're just like every other company, don't feel bad, this happens every day. Um, but two big concepts to make sure that we're putting out there are um, if you want to own the content that is created, um, work for hire. There's two principles you need to be aware of, work for hire and assignment. What work for hire means is basically a company owns the creations of their regular W-2 employee just by operation of the black letter law. Um, if a number of things happen, if the employee is working on something within the scope of their employment, you know, meaning this is not some moonlighting thing that they're creating. If this is part of their regular duties, um, just by operation of law, your company owns the, the creations of the employee. The other work for hire concept is if an independent contractor is creating something, the black letter law is the independent contractor who's actually, I like to call it fingers on the keyboard, whose fingers are on the keyboard creating something, they own it. Um, unless you have properly written, documented agreements as to rights. And one is that you hire them to create something for you as a what's called work for hire. And you need to have that very clearly spelled out in an agreement. However, what most people don't know is work for hire is governed by the copyright statute. And Section 101 of the copyright statute articulates only nine kinds of things that can actually be a work for hire. So just calling something a work for hire in your agreement does not make it so. Um, and you're going to you see here the nine, I won't read them all, but you'll see the nine types of things that are the only things that can qualify for being a work for hire. And they're pretty narrow. They're shockingly narrow. Um, so what do you do about that? Uh, you always, always, always want to have the alternative language in your agreements if you want it to be a work for hire in the first place. Um, then in the event it is not actually deemed a work for hire, the independent contractor has assigned the copyright rights to you and your company owns it. 
Um, and you can also do that after the fact. An assignment, you know, as you might know in corporate deals, you know, something's existed and some companies owned it for five years and then they had assigned the whole thing to you. That also needs to be in a properly written, documented agreement assigning the ownership of those copyright rights to your company. Um, now let's talk a little about licenses. Uh, and I'm going to break them down again more in detail. Um, but generally, you need to prove that you have the authorization or meaning a license. Um, if someone says, hey, you made a copy, and I don't think you're supposed to have made that copy, um, the defense that you had a license is an affirmative defense that is your burden. Um, a breach of a license agreement can not only uh, be a contract issue, so a breach of contract, you went beyond the scope of a license that you might have had, and we'll talk a little bit about that, um, but it also can be copyright infringement, the tort of copyright infringement. Um, you want to make sure that your licenses are clearly written and the scope is very clear. And we see clients get tripped up on this quite a bit. Um, scope means a number of things. Uh, here are some examples. The manner of use, meaning someone says, hey, yes, you can use my photo um, for this particular reason. Either they can say for anything, you know, ever, or they could say just on your website, or they could say just in this particular ad. Um, so that is scope. How broadly have they authorized you to use their piece of content that you have licensed? And then there's media, which is a really common issue for clients the media needs to be very clearly spelled out. Um, it may be print, it may be digital, those are two different rights. It could be all media in all forms, now created or forever, you know, ever created. Those things really matter um, in the scope. And then there's, of course, territory. Is it worldwide? Is it US only? Those sorts of things. And the term, when does it expire? How is it extended? Those sorts of things. And these are the things we'll talk about later you want to get Make sure you have your arms around in your management, in your digital, in your rights management kind of databases so you can track this and you know what your license does and does not allow you to do and you can pull it back up. Um, so again, you would like to have a library of written licenses from these third parties and know how to find them. Um, I mentioned a little earlier, certain licenses can be implied, meaning they're not a a formally written out license, but those do have some risks if you ever need to prove up your rights. Um, I just mentioned, are you tracking the expiration dates of your licenses? Uh, and then for anyone who is doing copyright applications, um, you also need to be really clear what you own and what you don't, what you licensed in, but you don't actually own. You just have the right to include it in your particular publication because you have to exclude that in a copyright application. Um, so copyright clearance, you know, my view is copyright clearance should be standard practice, something to be really mindful of at the same time as you're doing your advertising claim review. Um, and that is really going through, you know, item by item, looking at the text, the content, um, any photos, graphics, artwork, video, music, anything that you have in there, and check, do I have these rights? Do I have these rights to include this in this particular product, production, advertisement, etc.? cetera? Um, again, that includes checking on ownership rights. Make sure you actually really own it. If you don't, make sure the scope of your license has everything in order. Um, I, I personally really recommend having a system of filing the related agreements and licenses to your particular project in one place. Meaning, you know, I've run a legal department and it's very easy to take all your licenses and just shove them in some drawer or shove them in some, you know, online management kind of system, however, alphabetically or whatever. But if you have to prove them as to a particular project, it is a lot easier if you have created a file folder or a binder where for that project you have every single license all in one place. So you can just pull it and be able to be like, yep, here's all my licenses for this particular ad or this particular project. Um, again, copyright registrations, um, for anyone who doesn't know, they're a prima facie evidence of ownership, but the burden can shift to you to prove up your case. If uh, 
you happen to be the plaintiff and you're coming in with your registration and the defendant can figure out that you don't actually really own the rights that you said you did when you applied for your copyright registration. So it's important to really hang on to this stuff. Um, and then IT insurance that I mentioned before, you know, double check what's the, the status of your insurance if you think you're likely to have any IP, IP claims brought against you. Um, at the bottom here is an article that you are welcome to read that we published a while ago that are tips for clearing your rights and advertisements. And it, it sends you to the All About Advertising Law blog if you want more information. Um, <clears throat> music. Um, I tend to, I find that I always run out of time on these, so I'm going to try to keep moving quickly along because I see I'm only on slide 13 of 35 and we're about halfway through. Um, and speaking about halfway through, just to make sure that I do not forget, I'm going to give the code right now, the CLE code. I'll repeat it a couple times. Um, it is copyright 2020. And I'm told that is not case sensitive. So copyright 2020 is the CLE code. Okay, so um, music. Some tips on music that are things that I find to be not very commonly understood um, is when you are using someone's music without permission, absent a few really limited exceptions, you're infringing on their copyright. Um, something that is not very widely known outside of the music industry I've found are that um, for each recorded piece of music, there are usually two different sets of rights with two different sets of rights holders. And within them, there might be still multiple rights holders. There's rights to the musical composition, which is the music and any accompanying lyrics. I like to call that the sheet music, basically. So the publishing companies generally own the rights to the musical composition. Um, composers or the songwriters can also hold these rights. And then the second set of rights are the right to the sound recording. That is the specific fixed recording, recorded version of the musical composition. And that's most often owned by the record label. So take, for example, New York, New York. You know, Frank Sinatra sang it, Harry Connick Jr. sang it, many people have sung it. There's a musical composition to the song New York, New York. And then there's the record label that owns the rights to the particular sound recording, the Frank Sinatra one, the Harry Connick Jr. one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we've gotten a couple articles about music licensing that we put down here as well that you are certainly welcome to check out. Um, quick, quick things to understand in music licensing is there's four, music licensing is a really complicated area, but there's four um, buckets I'll just cover quickly as an overview um, that you may need to get depending on the situation. A master use license is for the original recording from the artist's album, usually granted by the record company. A sync license is something that comes up very regularly. That is the right to um, use the musical composition in an audio visual format. So that mostly comes up when you want to sync music with one of your advertising videos. You need permission from the author of the musical composition, um, which is often the music publisher in addition to the master use license. Public performance licenses, um, some examples of how they might come into play for your companies are um, if you're playing a song to an audience outside a small private group of friends and family, like you're playing music at one of your events, at a bar, restaurant, um, uploading a song to your website, those are just a few examples. Uh, and those are generally obtained through performing rights organizations performing rights societies called PROs. And then a mechanical license is to physically reproduce the musical composition, like to record your own cover of a song. Um, and those are often, uh, you can often obtain the mechanical licenses from a mechanical license society, Harry Fox being one of, the, one of them. So music license alternatives, really quick. Um, it takes a lot of lead time and budget to get major label music. So it's not something you want to find out at the last minute. If you do find out at the last minute and you aren't able to get the music you want, um, you could explore music in the public domain, which is very, very, very limited, very limited, much more limited than people think. Um, but it's music that is basically sufficiently old that it's no longer protected by the copyright law. Um, you could commission your own. 
I once had a, a very large client who needed music immediately. They weren't able to, they just didn't have enough lead time. And we actually managed to commission their own from a, a new up and coming artist who was ready to like do it immediately and wanted to um, have their music included. And that's rare, but that is a possibility. Um, Creative Commons, uh, you can, you can potentially get some music through Creative Commons. Make sure you're abiding by the licensing requirements, though, and you need to read those carefully. Um, there's also a quite a, a growing number of websites where you can license music that's already been pre-cleared. Um, graphics, videos, and movie clips. I'll touch on these quickly. Um, again, if you're using any of these, make sure that you have the proper rights. Um, one interesting thing that we see is, a, you know, a company logo, yeah, it's a trademark, but it can also be a copyright. And so make sure that if some outside party designed that, that you have the proper rights to the copyright as well, to your logo. Um, with videos, you know, I talked about if you want to use music in your video. Um, the, the big issues we see all the time for videos are the two sets of rights. And this relates to photos, too, we'll talk about. If you are using a video, you need to have the rights from the videographer, who will most likely own the copyright, unless they're your employee, um, as well as releases from um, the people who are featured in the video, and possibly location releases and other sorts of releases as well. So um, there's a number of different rights to clear with a video. Movie clips, I'll just touch on really quickly. Um, a lot of companies like to use them in their presentations because they wake people up and they're fun and they're funny. Um, but generally, you need a license to include movie clips in your various productions. Um, photos, you know, we often, really, really often see clients who believe that they paid, because they paid the photographer for the photo, it means they own it and they're good to go. Unfortunately, that's not how the copyright law works. Um, you need to have rights. You need to have rights, either ownership, you know, a written agreement as to ownership, or um, a license from the photographer. And again, make sure you're paying attention to scope, et cetera, et cetera, if it's a license. Um, same as what I just talked to, um, talked about with the videos, the subjects in the photos. You need a release. For the, the person, the individual in the photos for their rights of publicity or privacy. Um, and again, possibly location, if there's other products in the photos, et cetera, et cetera. And there's an article down here that was really interesting that Melissa Simon, my colleague, and I wrote oh, a couple years ago probably now um, that you should check out, which dealt with um, the, the, the two different rights, the copyright owner rights to the photo and then the rights to the person depicted in the photo. And there was some trouble there. Um, I won't spend too much time on this. This is the rights of publicity and privacy if you want to look back um, to this. Again, this is an example of why there's more than just copyright when you're using photos, videos, that sorts of thing, when you have actual subjects, actual people featured in them. Um, okay, now that you've actually properly acquired your content, Ideally, you have a rights management database. Uh, and I remember when I was in-house, and I remember being very spooked because they can be expensive, you know, to buy a commercial rights management database. Um, we have a number of clients, really big and really sophisticated clients, who have built them themselves, and they use Excel. Um, and it can be done. So um, you really want to have a rights management database. And use that for a number of purposes. Um, your folks internally may want to be able to pull content that you have licensed or you've managed to get proper rights to own, and they may want to see if they can use it again and again. Um, and we have some clients who have some really cool systems where they have red, yellow, green lights, that sort of thing, so that the business people can look in there and figure out, okay, is this totally cool to use? Is this absolutely not okay to use? or yellow light, do I need to go see the in-house counsel and have them help me figure this one out? Um, you know, as well as you're going to want to go back to your previous agreements. You are going to want to figure out when the rights expire. Do you need to, you know, renew it? 
Um, or if you get in a jam, you're going to want to be able to prove you really had authorization to use that particular piece of content. So rights management da databases, I get that they're hard to maintain. I get, I get it, um, but they're really, really important. We really recommend that. Um, online infringement issues and user-generated content is a big thing now. Um, again, because of strict liability, if your website or platform has content on there that was not authorized to be there by the copyright owner, you are strictly liable because it is on your website or your platform. A copy has been made on your server of that content. Unless it was posted there by a third party, which is typically the user-generated content, who is not an employee of your company, and you did not put it there yourself. You did not, you know, find it from a third party and say, hey, this is great, I like it, and you put it up there. Um, but if it was posted by the third party and you follow to the letter the steps articulated in Section 512 of the DMCA to qualify for the safe harbor um, from the otherwise strict liability, that's when this applies. Unless there is some other secondary theory of liability that would apply to you. And this can be a little complicated. We have a few articles here that hopefully would be helpful uh, if you want to read them at the bottom. Um, so I'll talk about this a little bit. I call it a sword and a shield. You know, you want to, if you have third-party content, you want to be aware of it to protect your company, but also it's um, a great tool if you have content that you find online and you want it down. So um, again, 512 from the defensive perspective, if you want to try to protect your company, um, you want to make sure um, that you are following it to the letter, which I'll get to in a minute, but I just want to make sure to, to underscore that 512 is not an entire bulletproof vest from everything. Um, if your company would be liable under another theory, um, of copyright liability, 512 is still not going to protect you. So don't, don't overly rely on it. Again, if your company actually posted it yourself, even though you thought it was authorized, um, if you don't adhere to every element of Section 512 in the DMCA, and I'm going to talk about these elements in a minute, if your company uh, is contributorily liable and meets the two elements here that we talked about earlier, if your company, uh, if someone can prove they're vicariously liable and then there's two elements, or if you induce others to infringe. Um, but let's talk about 512 uh, now. Again, the average company needs to do three main things to qualify for the Section 512 safe harbor. And any of these three things are fatal if you fail to comply with any of them. Um, one is you need to, you've probably seen you know, these DMCA 512 policies um, posted on various websites, you know, you need to designate in a publicly available location the agent who's supposed to receive the notifications and all the various information that's in the copyright statute. That should be on your website. Um, the second thing is provide the copyright office with the required information on the designated agent. It's a very simple filing. I think it's $6 filing fee. Um, you have to file that with the copyright office. Again, it's fatal if you don't to this safe harbor defense. Um, and those need to be renewed every three years or if something changes. If you acquire some new websites, et cetera, et cetera, you need to make a new filing there to cover the new websites, you know, under your company. Um, and respond expeditiously to any effective notifications. You probably hear them called takedown notices that you might receive from someone who is saying that their content is there and that it's not authorized to be there. Um, my practice tip as someone who's been outside counsel, for any of you who happen to already be your DMCA agent, because there is an email address that needs to be provided for people to send their, their DMCA notices to, I did not want to be the only one holding the bag if I missed an email and I was the DMCA agent. That terrified me because you lose your safe harbor from strict liability. So my practice tip to everyone is I had this, you know, email box like dmca at company company .com, 
And we had it point to about 10 people, 10, you know, high level um, people at the company. So if we ever got one, it was not only me who was getting that. So, and, you know, they all knew, come run down to my office and bang on the door and be like, oh my God, you know, we just got one. Did you see it? So just, I love to have more than just one person who is getting those emails because they are really um, important. So um, protecting your own copyrights, again, just really quick. And this is sort of more of the affirmative. Um, you uh, can send your own DMCA notice. And this has the various elements of what needs to be done if you believe your content is somewhere on a platform without your authorization. Um, and again, it's high stakes for the entity who gets it and doesn't take it down. And this also applies to web hosts, by the way, um, that you may know. So I won't go through all of these, um, but this is um, a great tool if you need to get some of your content down quickly, expeditiously, efficiently. Um, protecting your own copyrights. I mentioned I would talk about just really high level. Um, some of the sort of bigger buckets as far as things to think about, about protecting yourself um, is registration. We talked about you can't actually sue in federal court without a registration. Um, if you find someone infringing your content, a cease and desist letter, doesn't sound particularly powerful if uh, the recipient knows you don't have a registration and you're going to have a hard time suing them. So, you know, even though you may think you don't really end up in litigation much, you may end up sending cease and desist letters. And um, it's pretty inexpensive to file copyright registrations for the power that they give you. Um, and uh, like I said, you need to clarify in your copyright application what you own, and then you need to carve out what you don't own and what you just have in your publication by virtue of a license. So you do, that's another reason you want to be really clear on your rights. Um, and your registration can be attacked if you aren't properly disclosing things in your application, even if you ultimately get a registration. People can really poke at it if you didn't properly, if you sign things that weren't actually true. Um, another thing is, best practices is to try to register or do a, you know an overall review of your content every 90 days or so um, and that is because i mentioned the 90 day grace period that you get um, where if you didn't get a copyright application on file quickly enough and someone infringed you but it is still in the first 90 days from when your content was published you still would be eligible to seek attorney's fees and statutory damages. Um, and again, not everyone does it, we get it. But with websites, um, quarterly, you send in the new content from your website. Um, we have clients who have uh, software um, that has not been, they've not registered the revised versions in years and you know, software changes pretty commonly. Um, you know, books, all sorts of things. So we recognize you may not be able to register every, you know, marketing brochure you have, but some of your big stuff, really think about um, sort of an every 90 day review to try to shore that up. Um, again, uh, in due diligence, good copyright ownership and records can really make a buyer happy. It can also affect your purchase price. Uh, it can lower your purchase price. If, uh, you know, you happen to be a, com a company where Copyrights are one of your main assets, and it turns out that you haven't been really managing them ideally. That could either spook the buyer altogether, or it could um, impact your uh, purchase price. And you know, we we help clients uh, do that due diligence a lot of time and find things that are very unappealing when we're looking at the company they're considering buying as well. Um, licensing, depending on what your business is. Um, if you have content that can be licensed, a robust licensing con uh, program can be free money. Um, if you're able to monetize any content that you have and license it in an efficient manner, it can be, you know, it can be a real money maker. Um, and enforcement. Um, you know, this is, again, I know this doesn't apply to everyone on the call, um, but it is absolutely necessary for some of the really big content owning industries who are suffering from piracy, whether it be music, movies, TV, software, even photographers, you may be familiar, um, they do a lot of enforcement. And that's um, from the defensive end, 
you know, that's what we see many, you know, many, many times a week. Um, clients of Venable get letters from photographers um, who are not happy that a company used their photo without authorization. Um, so, but enforcement may be something that you need to think about doing, either just to enforce your rights, um, but also in some cases it can be a revenue stream for certain clients as well um, in terms of enforcing and resolving through settlements. So um, I won't entirely read these, but if this is useful to you or even if you're sharing these slides with others in your company, um, here are some examples of actual real cases. Um, I love this case. I wrote about the Beastie Boys case a lot. It might be because I love the Beastie Boys. Um, but this is a really great example. The Beastie Boys were famous for not allowing their music to be used in advertising. Um, but Monster Energy uh, did um, without a license. And after just tons and tons of litigation, um, they were ordered to pay the Beastie Boys, various Beastie Boys parties and record labels, um, $667,000 in attorney's fees and 1.7 million in damages because Beastie Boys ran a promotional video on their website and used portions of um, five Beastie Boys songs in the soundtrack and other references to the group. Um, the thing that, that really, you know, really is interesting here that I wanna to elaborate on is, um, you know, Monster Energy was defending that this infringement happened because they were, you know, floppy employees, um, et cetera, who they weren't willful, but they just weren't, you know, very organized when it came to licensing. Um, but the court did not disturb the jury's finding of willfulness. Um, and they made a really big deal about stating that Monster Energy had not performed um, training of their employees as to copyright and trademark content. And they found that they didn't have a comprehensive music licensing policy. Um, the court said they, they tasked unqualified and untrained employees. Um, and the real kicker was the court said they protected their own IP rights with more vigor than they did other rights, um, other parties' rights. So again, you know, this is really why I want to highlight that really having your own protocol internally is important for, for many, many reasons. Um, really quickly, just a case here, this is the right of, um, publicity kind of issue to highlight Nolan versus Getty Images. Um, she sued Getty because um, her photo was used in a manner, a particular manner, a particular scope that she was not happy about and did not believe she had authorized. So again, this is where scope is important. Um, and then these are two Michael Jordan related rights of publicity cases. I won't read them completely, um, but they show some of the really high stakes and really high awards that can happen in using the likeness of an individual um, without their authorization in your advertising. So um, I wanted to go through um, some pitfalls. I won't read them all. These are things I really hope are gonna be helpful if you wanna share them within your companies and have people you know, look at them and say, Oh, wow. Okay. I do understand how this applies to us. If you're doing any internal training, we have lots and lots of pitfalls of things that we see very regularly for companies to think about. Are they doing that? Um, indemnification, I wanted to highlight because I don't think I've talked about that before. Um, I used to say to my own CEO, you know, hey, I'll write you the most beautiful indemnification provision you have ever seen. Um, but if the entity who we're licensing this content from doesn't have any assets, not going to really help. Uh, so that's why you, we really should be properly clearing your own publications and getting your own, um, making sure you have media insurance for any claims against you. Um, I won't read these. These are other examples of pitfalls that we see with photos, videos, graphics, music. Um, pitfalls we've talked about, about being unable to sue in federal court. Um, we have seen, I'll just mention this because we've seen this with some clients, they want to send one of these DMCA takedown notices, but they're actually not the copyright owner or the exclusive licensee. There's something called a non-exclusive licensee and non-exclusive licensees can't send these DMCA notices and they can't make and sign the statements you're required to sign. So I wanted to, to highlight that because that's something that I have seen um, be misunderstood. Um, we have talked a lot about these photos. Retweeting, you may know, can be really dangerous about um, celebrities' pictures in particular. Um, 
you know, if they're not a paid endorser for your company, you could find yourself in, in some trouble, both vis-a-vis uh, -vis the copyright owner of the photograph and the celebrity, you know, whose likeness that is and the right of publicity that you're um, arguably violating. Um, and then here's some more practical tips. Let me just check any that I haven't already covered before. Um, really make sure you're building a public legal review into the publication schedule. I definitely got these things dumped on me at the very last minute. And if they're, if they're, a, you know, a significant size, you gotta, you gotta pull in who's ever doing your clearance early because it can take some time. Um, again, educate your marketing and publication and creative teams about these issues. I always found it really personally interesting, it seemed to me, marketing people and legal people, I think that they're wired very differently. I learned a lot from the marketing people. They learned a lot from me. It doesn't seem like we are always thinking about the same kind of issues. So really, internal education is important so they know when to call you. They know what issues they're supposed to be looking for. Um, again, the checklist. Um, I built one in sort of questionnaire form to help people, to help the, the business people prompt, they had prompts of, did you have this, do you have this, do you have this, do you have this? A, I liked to have that on my desk if they sent me something to review, because then it was a lot easier for me to understand what, what they had and what I should be looking for. And it also helps them on the front end to, to frame what they're supposed to have. Um, again, ideally run the agreements by counsel. Fair use analysis, really, really, really risky. Um, I really recommend, you know, it's really case by case, have experienced counsel um, advise anytime you think you're going to, you know, put all your eggs in the fair use basket. Um, we talked about media insurance. Um, I will say, I do want to underscore, in my experience, just having media insurance is not necessarily enough. And I have seen these applications myself, and my name is in some clients applications. Um, the carriers, at least from some I have seen, they want to know that publications are being reviewed and they actually ask for the name of the qualified lawyer and their, you know, bio who is doing the reviewing. And so I have some clients who put me in their renewals every year um, because, you know, media companies, they want to know that the things are being cleared. My understanding is, you know, they won't just insure anything if you're not actually following protocol because that's too risky for them. So, um, you know, again, really make sure you're understanding the scope of your policies if you have them and what they expect of you. And if they expect a legal review of your publications for them to insure or cover you, make sure you're aware of that. Um, stock photos, I had a question about that early this morning already. Um, stock photos, it doesn't, it's not so easy as, oh, I have a license to use a stock photo, I can do whatever I want with it. Their scope, they have particular terms um, that you need to stay within, particular uses, uh, particular numbers sometimes of impressions, et cetera, et cetera. So make sure you're really paying attention to that. Um, editorial, editorial use only photos, be careful on those if you're using stock photos. Um, another thing that you may not think about until you get bitten, is if you are using photos of people in anything, um, a practice tip is to actually attach a photo of the person to the license agreement or the model release. Because think about it, in seven years, you want to use that again, how are you going to remember which actual person is connected to which model release that you have? So it's it's helpful to have this in your own files. So you have a picture stapled to the release so you're clear exactly who you have a release from and who that person is if you want to use it when memories have otherwise faded. Um, celebrities we talked a little bit about. And that is the end of my slides. And I realize that we have not a lot of time. Um, but let me see how much time we do have. Um, and how many questions I can get through. And like I said, to the extent that I can't get to all the questions, my understanding is I get them afterward and I would be able to, to go through and respond to them by email is my understanding. So um, I, hope, I hope that's acceptable to people on the call. Um,
Okay. Um, there's a lot. I'm trying to figure out which ones I can cover in, in the remaining four minutes that would be a sort of a short answer. Um, I'm going to start with one here. Will email be acceptable if not ideal documentation for a grant of IP rights? And the answer is it depends. Um, for an assignment, no. That needs to be in writing and signed with a you know pen. Um, you need that for, uh, for an assignment. Um, exclusive licenses need to be in writing also. Um, when you get into a non-exclusive license um, for a particular purpose, a particular limited purpose, sometimes I understand you may only be able to have an email. Um, we also have a lot of social media things, you know, where we're trying to help clients who want to quickly say, hey, I just saw your photo. It's really cool. Can I use it? And, you know, sometimes there we even help them with how to get all that stuff across quickly and uh, very abbreviated rather than present them with a formal agreement. We understand that there's times when the situation lends itself to that. Um, so in some cases, email is okay. I would, I would encourage you always, always, always make sure you save it and really think about what you're saying in that email and how much detail you need from them to get the yes, I confirm, meaning the scope. What are you going to use it for? Is it a very limited purpose? If you want to use it more than some little limited purpose, you need to make sure you say that. The term, how long are they letting you use it? Where are they letting you use it? Those sorts of things. So email can be acceptable, but you know I really encourage you make sure you're covering those bases if you're using an email for a sort of minor kind of use. Um, and like I said, there's even implied licenses, which is not anything I really want to litigate because it is a high danger area if you don't have something that's actually documented. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll follow up with someone asked a question about royalty free websites. <laughs> I'll follow up with you individually on that question. I understand. <laughs> I understand what you're asking. Um, uh, as far as um, other questions that you have, um, feel free to shoot any right now as you have a lot of these I see here. Um, I think, or maybe more that I'll follow up with folks individually um, if you have any more. And I'm not sure in what real time I'm getting these. I think I get them with a bit of a delay. Um, but I do hope that we were helpful. I hope we covered some things that you didn't know. I hope we gave you some information that you can take back to your own internal teams um, to educate them and to try to make things run a little bit more smoothly. Um, to the extent that I was not able to answer a question here, um, either because they're not all coming to me in real time or just because it was uh, something sort of more specific, um, I will follow up with you afterwards. Um, if you have any questions that you even didn't send through here, my contact information is at one of the first slides. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, about one o'clock, so I'm going to have to end now. Um, I wish everyone a good rest of your day, and I hope that everyone stays well. Thanks so much.